Welcome again to fifth week of Missional Church Emerging. I know that each of you have been so blessed by this teaching. And if you miss any weeks, you can always go back and review them or watch them for the first time. It's on praisebibleinstitute.org. You can find it right there. And on our Facebook page, YouTube page as well. But John is just a brilliant man, full of the word, full of knowledge of missions and church. And to see the combination has been such a blessing. That's how God intended it to be. That's how it was in the beginning. The church had a mission. And we as the church have a mission. And that is the Great Commission. And we're called to fulfill it. Next week, we start a brand new course. And it's something that I believe really will resonate with a lot of people with everyone, because I think we've all experienced, I know we've all experienced at some point, loss and disappointment. And over this last year of COVID, a lot of people have experienced loss and disappointment. Pastor friend of mine that, may, that some of you know, Joe Bologna, has experienced himself in his life, in his testimony, a lot of lo loss and disappointment. And so he definitely has a grace to teach on it. And so he's gonna teach a five week course on living with loss and disappointment. And uh, that will start next week, Wednesday, same time. Also, as we um, make sure before you leave and those who are online, uh, we want to bless John for investing into our lives for these past five weeks and just bless him. So really pray about what the Lord would have you give. And it's giving into good ground. Converge is an amazing ministry that's um, affecting the nations. And so know that when you give into that ground, it's a ground that goes worldwide. And so um, you can give here. We'll have a basket in the back. And for those online, you can go to praisebibleinstitute.org. And you can see under um, giving, there is a place to give. PayPal, through PayPal. So um, you can sow right from our website. All right. Any other announcements, Liz? I think that's it. All right. Here is John Henry. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm excited that it's the last session, N not because I don't enjoy doing this, but because it's been an interesting journey. Um, as you could see from the slide, that we started with thresholds. And I encouraged those that listened, and if you missed it, I hope you do go back and listen. Um, I encourage those who are participating to write down their story, their threshold moment, and to review that. I encourage you to do that if you haven't yet. Um, it's a surprising what an impact it can have on your life and then on those that you have an opportunity to share your story with. Uh, we talked about his call to all. There is a call on the entire body of Christ. God intends that we would use the gifts that he used us, that he called us with for his purposes, his gifts and his calling are without repentance, meaning he doesn't change his mind about it. And then we talked about his mission has a church. Uh, well, we often hear that the church has a mission. I believe that it's the opposite way around. You know, God is going to carry his bride over the threshold, and his mission is to do that. So his mission has a church. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the groom. He's the one that is the one that started this whole thing. And uh, his, his mission is not changed. He wants to fill the whole earth with his glory, the knowledge of his glory. He wants every nation to be discipled. He's um, not kidding about that. He's not just jerking our chain saying, keep busy until I come back and I'll rescue you from this horrible place I've left you in. No, he wants us to fulfill his mission. And just like he said, it is finished on the cross. He is going to one day say, it is finished in terms of his mission. Now, I know that's not a little bit different than most of our eschatologies, our end time theology, but I challenge you to look deeper into the scriptures to see that the, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not decided I'm going to be fickle about my mission. I'm going to say, go do it and then not fulfill it. No, he's going to fulfill it. And then uh, we talked about our stand and some of the fight, some of the struggle, uh, but that stand is that we must stand firm 
against an adversary and stand firm in terms of going through the fire, the fire of testing to be purified. Tonight, we're going to talk about your crown. So for those of you that have not yet been introduced to me, I'm John Henry. My wife and I have been part of this fellowship in one way or another for over three decades. And I know that we haven't been regularly attending here of late, but we've been sent missionaries from this fellowship since the time when we did our discipleship training school back in 1985. So we're very honored to be supported by this fellowship and to be partnering with this fellowship for over three decades. Uh, so I also want to say if you're listening online, I encourage you to let us know that you're there. Um, perhaps click like or share or post your name. Just let us know you're there. I'm grateful that you are and I'd love to interact with you if you have questions and I encourage you to post your questions. Um, as I've also said many times, this church, Praise Tabernacle Church, is a missional church, and most who are here know they're called. They're here to be equipped and empowered to be sent, to be sent into this neighborhood, to this community, and to the world. Uh, the purpose of these messages and for the Praise Equipping class has been for us to continue to emerge as a missional church. And um, we know that we exist to fulfill Christ's mission. We're going to talk more about uh, that. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about the crown tonight, um, or we're going to wrap up with the crown. We're going to be building up to a crescendo of a crown, a reward. And uh, we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about a table. So tonight's going to be about a table and a cross and a crown. Um, We've been looking at the qualities that Peter has provided in his second letter. He instructs us to make every effort to add to our foundation of faith. Those seven qualities are built on that foundation, that faith that he has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And to make our calling and election sure. Our overarching theme, as I've said before, is that God's church does not have a mission. God's mission has a church. And we've worked our way through these seven steps uh, from 2 Peter chapter 1. We've worked our way through faith to moral goodness to knowledge to self-control and perseverance. And um, that was in our last session. So what we need to do now is pray because we're going to launch into this. Uh, if you would pray with me. Lord, I pray tonight that you'd help us again. We ask for fresh revelation. We want revelation of what table fellowship is really all about. Revelation of the cross, where your love was demonstrated. And God, we want to know something about this crown, which you promised to those who finish the race. I pray we get a vision of heaven tonight, a celebration of when you do carry your bride over the threshold where we see those 24 elders laying their crowns at your feet. Help us to take these last steps together, adding godliness and brotherly kindness and love. Help us to grow in intimacy of godliness. Help us to love our neighbors through the common grace of brotherly kindness. Help us to join you and our neighbors at the table of fellowship. And finally, show us how both godliness and brotherly kindness are necessary to know the depths of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight's lesson is the most challenging that I've taught. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, said it's Deep magic, referring to the stone table where he was sacrificed, Aslan the lion, who represented Jesus, says, the witch knew the deep magic, but there's a magic deeper still, which she did not know. Tonight, we're going to ask God to reveal that deeper magic. 
At each of our sessions, God's been reminding us that the wedding feast in heaven will include people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Last session, we learned that we need to add perseverance because anyone who's called to make a difference will go through a time of testing. We go through the refiner's fire because the fire is designed to destroy that which is useless in our lives. And that fire softens our hearts so that we're willing to do the things that are for the fulfillment of his mission. So we embrace that fire of refining tonight so we can stand before the audience of one, Jesus. In that place of personal surrender, standing in the fire, we add godliness. That's when your life begins to ooze with the meaning of the words from the old hymn, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Godliness is not something you can learn in a classroom. You can't learn it on an online course. It's not something you can gain by merely reading a book or memorizing a few Bible verses. It's not a quick fix or a three-step plan. It's not a certificate you can get in a seminar. It's not something that necessarily happens because you attend church either, though all those things are good and important. God seeks those who will participate in his mission to seek and save the lost. He seeks. He's the seeker. He seeks those who will never forget that they too were lost. Therefore, their worship of him is in spirit and in truth. He seeks those who will change nations, bringing his light into the darkness of every sphere of influence, every mountain, every high place, everywhere and wherever the enemy has taken control. And because they've persevered, they know why the Bible says they overcame him, meaning the adversary, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But God does not want his sent ones to operate with the same tools that the adversary uses. In other words, we do not take back control, and this is not a king of the hill contest, where the church is expected to dominate the mountains or the spheres of influence. No. We expose darkness And that darkness must flee. We do that not fighting against flesh and blood, but instead pulling down strongholds. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, anything that declares that knowing God is unimportant, including the sciences, the arts, sports, education, business, law and government, journalism and the media, and more. And we should not be naive thinking that this will be easy. That's why we must go through the fire before we can chase away the darkness. So then, how does a godly person, how does godliness help in Christ's mission? How does God change nations through his godly ones? Lauren Cunningham said this, they do it with open hands. He explained this at the Lord of the Nations conference in 1988 in Washington, D.C. With only five minutes to speak, Lauren asked the delegates from 99 countries being translated into six different languages simultaneously. He asked them to do something. And to help you remember, I'm going to ask you all to do something right now, too. I'm going to ask you to open your hand. Hold it out, face up. What does that hand represent to you? It's the hand of a servant. You put something in that hand, and you can take something out. The kingdom of God is about giving and receiving. Now close that hand and hold it like you're steering a wheel or holding a bit and a bridle. 
The psalmist writes, do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle. This is the hand of manipulation and control. Now hold your fist in the air. What does that represent? This is the sign of rebellion and demanding rights. Finally, open your hand in the air. That's the sign of a volunteer and a worshiper. And when you hold both hands in the air, that's the sign of someone who has surrendered. God calls his godly ones to fulfill his mission by surrendering, volunteering, worshiping, and serving. Not by manipulating and controlling and rebelling and demanding rights. So here's a warning for you. If you're not prepared to open your hand, to surrender your rights, and serve him in any way he says, you probably will still face the fire. You may, may need to go back to the beginning of our seven steps that we've been going through. You may need to go back to learning who God is. Or you may need to add knowledge to learn about his ways. Or you may need to add self-control so that you can learn to yield. So that you don't think more highly of yourself than you should. Let's not try to be the king of the mountain. Let's not, let's not fight for what's right. Let's let Jesus be king of the mountain. Every mountain. So godly, godliness begins after the fire, and we learn godliness through the simple things. Not in a classroom or in a book, but through the common, ordinary, and intimate connections we have every day. And that's why the table is so instrumental. Our table is the heart and the center of our home. It's the place our family comes together, the place of welcome, where we welcome friends, neighbors, strangers. Mary and I love to invite people over to savor a meal together. We chop and saute vegetables and bake bread and stir sauces and sit down to a meal where we have rich conversation with others around the food that we love. That's how we live, how we love each other, how we taught our children, and how we've learned about people from all over the world. We thought everyone enjoyed meals like that, meals as families, inviting friends. We thought everyone invited people into their homes to share their lives, but that's not true. Many people, including Christians, rarely sit down at the table together with their families, let alone with anyone else. We've shared our table with international students, young people from China and Japan and India and South Africa and Saudi Arabia and many other places. We've hosted people from various religious and non-religious backgrounds, from happy homes and broken homes. And we've learned how very desperate everyone is for authentic relationships. Much of our life is a table story. When we talk about breaking bread with others, we're talking about sharing intimate time with people. So what is intimacy? Many people immediately go to thinking something between sexual contact, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the common greeting that is pronounced saubona. It literally, mean, it literally means I see you, you're important to me, and I value you. It's a way to make the other person visible. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's a way to make the other person visible and to accept them and to let them know that they're valuable. That you accept them, including their virtues, their nuances, and everybody has them, and their flaws. This is how we can emerge as a missional church. We invite strangers to our tables where we can see each other and tell them they're important and that they, that they are valued. So 
Can we do that? Are we doing that? Let's commit together tonight to start a lifestyle of opening our homes and our tables to strangers, to the lost, to neighbors, and also to missionaries and to those who desire to become missionaries. This isn't a program or a campaign or a strategy. It's a simple, living, godly lifestyle in Christ. And it's got a priority of Christ's mission. There's a powerful truth that Lauren Cunningham, the founder of Youth with a Mission, shared with me about the importance of intimate time with others. He said this, and it has to do with history and missions and church. Incredible statement he made. The apostolic stream of authority flows down through history by association. Let me unpack that. It's personal contact. The more time I spend as a missionary who's traveled and ministered in about 40 countries over three decades, the more I've come to understand this simple truth. The apostolic stream, okay, that's the missional flow of authority, the entrepreneurial energy, flows through history when people have close personal connections with missionaries and those who are embracing this missional call. Like I said, it's not learned through a classroom. Despite my master's degree in global leadership and all the studies I've done of revival and missions history, it's always been my close relationships with missional leaders like Lauren Cunningham that have ignited my heart and God's heart for the nations in my life. But my experience isn't enough, so let me give you a couple examples from history. One is David Brainerd. Some of you may know that name. He was a missionary to the Native Americans in the early 1700s. And he lived for a time with Jonathan Edwards. Now, some of you should know that name. He's the author of the famous sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which apparently launched the first great awakening on the North American continent. Another story is about a generation later, a guy named Henry Obakaya. He was a 10-year-old boy growing up in the Sandwich Islands of Hawaii, and he was orphaned suddenly when his uncle killed both his father and his mother. And he fled with his little brother on his back, but he couldn't get ahead of the spears flying toward them, and his brother was killed too. Grief-stricken, he swam out and became a refugee camp cabin boy on one of Captain Cook's ships, which eventually landed him in New Haven, Connecticut in 1809. Timothy Dwight, grandson of Jonathan Edwards, was the president of Yale, and he found Henry O. on the steps of Yale crying and saying, No one give me learning. Dwight had been preaching daily at Yale's chapel, which effectively launched the Second Great Awakening. And Timothy Dwight welcomed Henry into his home. Do you remember Samuel Mills? That was from our first night. He was a student at Williams College who led four of his fellow students at the Haystack Prayer Meeting, which effectively launched the North American Missionary Enterprise. We talked about him that first night and we learned that he founded the first North American missionary board or appealed for that to happen. Well, here's a letter from Henry O. And he wrote it in, actually in his journal. He said, Mr. Dwight wished me to make acquaintance with Mr. Mills. He wished me to go home with him. I then left New Haven and went home with Mr. Mills. I lived with his family in the year 1810. You see what's happening here? Henry O. not only learned English and learned the truth of the gospel, he got infected with a passion to become a missionary. Being close to both Dwight and Mills, Henry O. began to make plans to take the gospel back to Hawaii. He started translating portions of the gospel into his native language, but sadly... He died of tuberculosis before he could go. 
So a team of seven married couples was formed and sailed from Boston. And 164 days later, they landed in Kailua Bay, Kona, Hawaii, Kona Coast of the Big Island, on October 23, 1819. Did you know the Kona Coast is the same place where God led YWAMers to establish the University of the Nations 158 years later? In YWAM, we believe that non-formal learning that occurs at the table, we call it live-learn, which is a principle of our philosophy of education. We spend time with each other, especially at the dining table, Visiting lectures are encouraged to join students for meals. We all learn non-formally. We watch, we listen, we find models, examples, by watching the godly lives of those around us. This is what missional life is like. This is what an emerging church does. The little church I joined shortly after I gave my life to Christ is in Kinderhook, New York. They meet in a refurbished barn called Solomon's Porch. When I arrived there in 1982, it appeared like a throwback to the hippie period and the Jesus movement of the 1960s. But the eight to 10 families that meet there at Solomon's Porch practice missional living. They host missionaries, they send missionaries, they visit the mission field, they even sit around tables when they gather for their weekly worship services. I was a new believer with a new job as a district executive with the Boy Scouts of America. Pastor George and his wife Carol invited me to live in their home. I was welcomed as a member of their family. I sat at their table. I learned things that you can't teach in Bible school or seminary. Whenever anybody had exciting news about the day, George said, save it for dinner time. By doing that, he made the family gathering at the table an event that everyone was excited to be a part of because we saved our stories to share with everyone. Conversation around the table was um, not always spiritual, um, a lot of times conversation just got silly. In fact, during the two and a half years that I lived with George and Carol, I can't recall a single dinner when some kind of bathroom story didn't come up. I learned how to relax and enjoy and laugh with a healthy family. It was a safe place. You see, growing up in my home wasn't always happy. My four brothers and I definitely had happy memories, good, mem good moments, and my parents really did love us. But many of my earliest memories back in the 1960s are overshadowed by the tensions of living with two very unhappy parents. I mentioned before that my parents were divorced, and they both remarried, and the pain of that divorce and the, and the, and the continued tension even at the dinner table, was often unbearable. Acting out, rebellion with anger, turning to self-destructive behaviors just became my way of coping. I tried, but I stopped caring after being a good kid in my teen years. Divorce didn't make the tension go away. All of my aunts and uncles also divorced. So for me, I thought marriage was an impossible dream. I thought family happy happiness was unrealistic. Then as a college graduate, I surrendered my life to Christ, and I was welcomed as a member of a family that loved God and each other. And I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't know it, but there was, but I was there in Pastor George's home to be reparented, to be healed, and to get infected with a missionary calling. On Wednesday mornings, George and I met for prayer. We memorized scripture, 
including all of Romans chapter 6 and chapter 8. George asked me to direct the church's coffee house outreach ministry, which meant I booked various local talent, including some heavy metal Christian bands. We packed the coffee house almost every Friday night. And if the band didn't do it, I'd stand up and I'd preach. And I'd always give an altar call. But the more I preached and the more people responded, I began to feel more and more uncomfortable about what I was doing. I realized I was missing something. The disciples all missed something too. When you don't know something, you don't know that you don't know, right? The disciples didn't understand what really happened when Jesus died a criminal's death on a Roman cross. Two disciples who didn't understand were met by the resurrected Christ as they were left Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. Jesus hid his identity from them. After listening to them moan for, I don't know, maybe a few miles about the death of the one they thought was supposed to be the Messiah, he stopped them and he said, oh, you who are slow of heart to believe. Then he taught them everything the scriptures had to say about their Messiah, about himself. Can you imagine what that Bible study was like? When they arrived at their destination, they, lived, they invited the stranger to join them for a meal. Then sitting at the table, Jesus broke the bread, somehow revealed himself, and then, poof, disappeared. Perhaps he showed his scars on his hands and wrists, the same scars we will see for all eternity, a reminder of the cost of sin. The two disciples were so excited and their hearts burned in their chest so much because of what Jesus had taught them that they ran seven miles all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the others. These two dejected disciples became eyewitnesses to the truth. And it happened at the table breaking bread. It's through close personal encounters, especially at the place where spiritual hunger and natural hunger converge at the dining table, that God burns his message into our hearts. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, proclaimed the truth that God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. After many missteps and personal failures, Peter was finally standing before the audience of one, willing to go anywhere God would lead him, without concern for his own comforts or safety or reputation, even if others wouldn't follow him. This is godliness. When Peter spent time with people, including the Gentile centurion, Cornelius, he infected them with a passion to know Jesus and to make him known. This is godliness. And the next step is adding brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness seems so common, so ordinary. As a good citizen, we pay taxes, we vote, plant trees. As an activist in the public square, we write op-eds and letters to Congress. We protest, we raise money, we serve the needy. In our private devotional life, we pray and we worship. And as evangelists, we proclaim the good news. These are all areas where God calls us to be his witnesses. C.S. Lewis writes, as Christians, we can't love the whole world. But we should remember that God has placed us in a specific community at a particular time. We're called to love those around us. Loving them means serving them and in doing so, we become the best of citizens. So you might ask, after all these qualities we've talked about, do we really need a call from God to be kind? Yes, if you're human, you do. Because fulfilling the call to love our neighbors is not really so easy. 
That's why Peter exhorts us to make our calling and election sure. Because we're so deeply flawed, we don't understand the difference between calling and election. We understand that God has called us to himself. But what is election? Election has been misunderstood for thousands of years. The people of Israel regarded themselves as God's special favorites. But that was wrong. God's special choosing of their nation was not that they were above or better than any others. Because they thought they were special favorites, they became proud and arrogant. And you could even say they were narcissistic. They thought they were the center of the universe. It's not just the Israelites that do that. Americans do that. And the Christian church has also done that down through the centuries. When you think too highly of yourself, you tend to be aloof. You don't really care about the people around, it, around you. Think a moment about why those two men on the road to Emmaus were so de dejected. They had a hope for a Messiah. But which Messiah? Which hope? There's two extremes of hope. Both are wrong. One is the hope for heaven, and the other is a hope for your own nation. In the case of the first century Jews, these two men were not hoping to go to heaven. They were hoping for Israel's conquest over her enemies. That's why they were sad. But those who put their hope in heaven can have it wrong too. Many um, hope to, to be rescued from this world. They put their hope in the second coming, the rapture. But that means they're less concerned for those who have not yet heard of the Savior. Do you see the problem? That's not brotherly kindness. It's not loving your neighbor or your enemies like Jesus does. Jesus said many are called or invited, but few are chosen. The chosen are the elect. Paul wrote to Timothy saying, God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The call goes out to all, but being chosen, being the elect, is different. To be chosen is to be set apart for a purpose. It's like when you take a paper clip and you unwind it and you twist it and make it into some kind of tool, special instrument for a particular purpose. It's the difference between special grace and common grace. God's special grace is your election. The Jews had a special grace, a purpose, to bring the Messiah. But your election, your special purpose, does not set you above others. It simply means God has chosen you and not someone else to do it. And if you neglect to do it, he can choose someone else. God's common grace is for all. He calls all to be saved. God's common grace is like the sunshine. Common grace is meant for the common good. Common grace is like the sun which rises on the evil and the good. And then the rain which falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We love our neighbors with the same common grace. It does not require a special call. Showing God's kindness can be done by anyone and often is done by those who are not even followers of Christ. Brotherly kindness is a common, ordinary act which does not require special grace. To grasp the love of God, we must first add brotherly kindness. Do you see how easy it is to get the idea that you're the special ones and how that can trip you up when it comes to fulfilling Christ's mission? You can neglect the mission of God. So there will be a rapture, and we will, it's okay for us all to long for his appearing. 
But we must remember that we're all charged with the task of making disciples of every nation. That task is not finished. If there's any one thing that has kept the church from fulfilling her mission, it's probably because the vast majority of Christians have not yet added brotherly kindness. They have not yet learned what it means to love their neighbor. We need to do this. And we need to teach others to do this. This brings us back to what Lauren Cunningham said. He said, apostolic stream of authority flows through history by association, by close contact. Paul instructs Timothy. He says, and the things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Did you catch that? There's four generations in one sentence. Things you, Timothy, heard from me, Paul, and trust to reliable people who will also be able to teach others. We need to have an infectiousness about this ministry we're a part of, personal, close contact with others. What are some of the consequences of failing to, to, to love our neighbors, to add brotherly kindness? Well, modern evangelism has been reduced to an impersonal argument, to be one on the streets with a tract or a blowhorn. The gospel's been reduced to a sort of sales pitch. Rather than meet eye to eye across tables in intimate relationships, many bring people to church to hear a preacher. That's not wrong. Don't misunderstand. But very often, that church gathering sounds more like a sales pitch. When modern preachers say, every head bowed, every eye closed, sometimes with the lights down, it's creating an atmosphere of spiritual pressure. It's time to make a decision. It's like buying a used car. Do you hear me saying this in church? A good preacher will simplify the steps of receiving the gospel and give you an opportunity to respond and pray. But modern evangelism is like a crusade, a tent meeting. It's become a private faith decision rather than a public declaration. But yeah, people go public. But when they walk down the aisle or the sawdust trail, they do it because they're often caught up in the emotions of the setting which may be the lights or the music, the cheers of the crowd and certain certainly the amazing persuasive ability of the preacher up front. But this is my point. The gospel is about an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's about a public dec declaration that he is Lord, not merely that he's uh, the Lord of your private life, like you've received Jesus in your heart. It's a declaration that he is Lord everywhere. The whole gospel is summed up in the words, Jesus is Lord. Despite all the problems with evangelism today, many still do make genuine commitments to Christ. Many do get plugged in to real relationships. But how many have walked away happy but a bit confused, uncertain? And how do they... Do you think maybe a lot of them misunderstand what just happened when they walked up to the altar? How many fail to thrive in their relationships? This is where a healthy missional church steps in with invitations to intimate table conversations. Because we live in a culture that values privacy, independence, and God forbid, consumerism, we have unconsciously emphasized one part of the gospel, and those are two words, and I'm going to probably offend some when I say them. Born again. We've turned the born again experience into a commodity. When did Jesus say, you must be born again? It wasn't to the multitudes who sat on the hills of Galilee. He said those words privately to an elderly man, a Pharisee, a secret nighttime meeting. 
to the multitudes, he said, you, corporately, not just individually, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus entered various towns announcing the good news. What did he say? Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. That wasn't just a call for individual repentance. It was a call for radical change in the entire world. Simply saying, you must be born again, by itself, is not the whole gospel. The gospel is a radical proclamation that Jesus is Lord over all. And it's not just about your personal salvation or your ticket to heaven. It's about the transformation of your entire life and the transformation of whole nations. When I was preaching in that coffee house each week, I began to recognize a hole in my gospel, the gospel I was presenting. While living with my pastor's family, I was learning so much about the kingdom life and this radical missional lifestyle. I became convinced I needed to learn more, so I thought, well, maybe I should go to seminary or Bible school. I began sending out applications. One day I got a call from a seminary recruiter who interviewed me over the phone. He asked me, well, well, tell me about your daily life. I explained. I live with my pastor's family. I direct our coffee house outreach. I spend a few hours a week with my pastor, memorizing scripture and praying. And it was quiet on the other side of the line. Are you there? The voice on the other side said, you have it better than we do in seminary. We have great classes, but we don't have discipleship. I really didn't understand yet, but I was learning this. The gospel of the kingdom is about deep relationships and a deep affection for Christ. That works its way into every area of life. We need to dig deeper now. There's a few major themes that run straight through the entire Bible. And and this is one of them. God is inviting us to sit at table with him. Everywhere in Scripture, there is this beckoning call. Won't you come and dine with me? He's inviting the nations to join him at the table. But we fall short. This was where Peter had it wrong because he was more concerned about his Jewish culture and traditions than he was about Jesus' mission to the Gentiles, the nations. So Peter and most of the earliest Christ followers who were Jewish struggled with what Paul was teaching and demonstrating as he sat at tables with Gentiles. And Paul confronted Peter about it. And if you want to know more about that, read Galatians chapter 2. This was the greatest struggle of the early church. So they had a council meeting in Jerusalem. It was the first church council. And it was decided that it was okay to sit at the table with Gentiles. They sent out a letter to all the churches and they made sure to put instructions in there about keeping themselves from sexual impurity and abstaining from food polluted by idols. Pastor George had a missional lifestyle that was infectious. Around the dinner table, I came to know many other friends of his vicariously through the stories they told. So when they came to visit the church, these friends, and to sit at the table with their beloved friends, I felt like I already knew them. Here's a story about a married missionary couple that continues to impact my life and many others. Beginning in the late 1960s, George took youth on missions trips to Central America, including two teenagers, Tom and Libby. These two ended up joining YWAM in Amsterdam and later became missionaries to Afghanistan. And for three decades, they lived there. Yes, they raised their family there. They served through several wars, the Soviet occupation, nights of terror, bombs blasting, and marauding gangs of men with machetes. They remained through the Taliban takeover 
and finally the U.S. invasion after 9-11. Tom and Libby are the most, impression, Im, most impressive missional believers I ever came across. And I met them the first time at Solomon's porch and at George and Carol's table in the 1980s. This was before I joined YWAM. Years later, while we were living in India, starting a new university missions leadership course, Mary and I met Tom and Libby at a Christmas dinner. What an amazing and joyful surprise. We were privileged to host Tom and Libby in our home a few years later after that. It was, I think, 2009. But then, in the summer of 2010, I received an email saying Tom had been killed along with his team in the mountains of Afghanistan by the Taliban. When we ran a discipleship course here in Ocean City in 2018, I invited Libby to come speak to our group. Most had no idea who she was. She's a mild manner woman teaching, teaching with a soft voice. She decided that this teaching engagement I was inviting her to was going to be her last before she retired back to the Albany, New York area where she grew up. What had Libby been doing all those years after her husband died? She was speaking all over the world, including the keynote speech at Cape Town 2010 the third Lausanne Congress on world evangelization, which was started by Billy Graham. This event is the most representative gathering of Christian leaders in the 2,000-year history of the Christian movement, with 4,000 leaders from 198 countries. When she spoke, she appealed to the body of Christ worldwide to not call her husband a martyr. That's right. See, she said she and Tom had served and loved the Taliban people for decades. Through incredibly intense and frightening times, they came to love the people, and many came to faith in Christ. So with a gentle voice of spiritual authority, she said, please don't call my husband a martyr. She said, I'm sure they offered to give them a free clinic, but they must have misunderstood. Think for a moment what kind of heart it took for her to say that. She has successfully added brotherly kindness. She shared stories with our group that night in the discipleship course we ran in Ocean City, and here's one of them to the best of my memory. Libby walked into the clinic, clinic in Kabul one day, and she found a few Taliban warriors beating up her husband, Tom. He was lying on the floor, bloodied from his beating. And Libby immediately shouted, stop. So they turned to her, and Tom struggled to get up and to save her. And he said, leave her alone. You can come to dinner tonight. That stopped everything. And Libby looked at Tom like, what did you just say? Libby struggled to get, to help Tom get home, and then, then they started to prepare the meal. And when their Taliban guests arrived, they carried their guns into the house, and they sat with their guns at the table. They were dirty and smelly, and they hadn't changed or cleaned up for what seemed to be weeks. They were loud and rude. A piano was in their home from the British Embassy. It was left behind when they evacuated on the night of terror when the Taliban went through the streets killing every expatriate. And yes, you guessed it, Tom and Libby stayed behind. They did not evacuate. They took the risk to stay back because they loved the people. And because of that love, they survived. But the question now was, would they survive this dinner? One of the Taliban members stood up from the table, insulted his host, grabbed his automatic rifle, walked over and started banging on the piano with his rifle. 
Libby got up, shouted, no, stop that. And Tom whispered, they have guns. She sat down and started playing a hymn and singing a hymn. What's that? The Taliban asked. It's a hymn. He seemed to really like the music and he was curious about the words. This was when she made a crucial decision that could have cost them their lives. She pulled out a hidden Bible, which was illegal to possess. And she showed the words of the hymn from the Bible. This Taliban warrior became so curious, he wanted to know more. And amazingly, they struck a friendship and began to meet regularly. And the Taliban warrior met Jesus Christ at Tom and Libby's dinner table. She showed us, or Jesus showed us by example, this missional lifestyle that I'm talking about. He sat at table with tax collectors and prostitutes, right? And when the Pharisees objected, he told a story about leaving the 99 to find the one lost sheep. And he explained how they celebrate in heaven. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. When your life is centered on what makes heaven happy, sharing the grace of God in common ways with friends and enemies, the righteous and the unrighteous, that's when you know you've added brotherly kindness to your, li to your life. What I'm suggesting here is that there's a deeper, wider, and more intimate way of doing evangelism and discipleship. And everyone does it every day. We all eat. We can all experience the intimacy of sharing our meals with someone. Jesus is not telling us, um, he's not just telling us, he's also demonstrated to us. If you don't already, I encourage you to share your table. This is what missional living looks like. Table fellowship was central to early church gatherings. Long before all the complex religious practices that we've developed, long before the beautiful sanctuaries and the hierarchy of leaders were added to the simplicity of sharing the life of Christ with others, believers shared meals from house to house. Though some gatherings may have been in the synagogues or a rented hall, much of the growth of the church came in the intimate spaces, especially table fellowship. Without the New Testament scriptures, people gathered to remember the words Jesus spoke. They experienced the power of the Holy Spirit and spoke with simple gospel messages, and the church rapidly grew. People opened their homes and others brought their appetites, desiring to grow in their relationship with Jesus. So it appears Jesus intends, and the early apostles taught, that we should be priests offering spiritual sacrifices from the altar of our tables. How? He said, remember me when you eat and drink. He instructed his followers to remember his sacrifice. The New Testament says we are a royal priesthood. This priesthood of all believers is the call to intercede, to pray, and offer a different kind of sacrifice on a different kind of altar. And our intercession should be for all people. All nations. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And the impact of brotherly kindness, the simple acts of sharing our life in Christ with our neighbors, will eventually lead us to engage every arena of society. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked its way through the dough, through all the dough. We're all called to do the small acts of kindness. And as we do, we become the salt of the earth. As we prepare to add love now 
Let's look at the story where Jesus was asked by a teacher of the law what must be done to inherit eternal life. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Perhaps the teacher feared his relationship was not sufficient, his relationship with God. I think he tried to justify himself and diverted attention, so he asked, well, well, who's my neighbor? Jesus showed that it's not a religious leader or even a Jew, but a Samaritan, someone his audience despised, who performed the act of common decency, caring for the needs of a man that was beaten up on the Jericho Road. And when Jesus responded, he didn't define neighbor as a noun. He defined it as a verb. He showed who was being a good neighbor. Jesus commands us to do the common, ordinary thing, to love our neighbor as ourselves. In this, Jesus encapsulates all the law, saying there is no command greater. And Paul writes to the Galatians, saying all the law is summed up in this command, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so let's find out what love is. Dr. Loder, a professor of practical theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, said, the main motive of all of life is to give and receive love. Love's a sacrificial giving of oneself to another. It's willing the highest good for others. But love also carries with it the baggage of human failures. Love subjects even the most generous person to the fear of failure and rejection. Today's bride and groom tremble as they recite their vows to one another, so long as we both shall live. They fear they could be like their parents. Most marriages fall or fail, even Christian marriages. Dr. Loder said that we're afraid of two things. We're either afraid of absorption or we're afraid of annihilation. The fear of absorption says, I married you, not your family or your dreams or your problems or your debts. Even in the best of marriages, defenses go up and negotiations start to push the love out. Married, most married couples might think they're fighting over money, but they're really fighting over trust and the preservation of space. Love gets lost in the management of the relationship. The fear of annihilation says, if you divorce me, it will kill me. Human love has a negative side. It gives way to anger, neglect, boredom, and ultimately, aggression, distrust, and violence. How can such fears be subdued? Marriage is meant to be the most intimate of human love. But marriage can exhi exhibit the failure and ambivalence of human love. How can we fulfill our calling to love if loving relationships are so temporary and fragile? What complicates things further is that when human love is strongest, that's when there's the greatest danger of failure. It's paradoxical. How can we fix it? We're like computers with faulty operating systems, always computing but never able to compute God's kind of love. If we fail to upgrade, we'll continue to produce failure, pain, and broken relationships. Is there a solution to the problem? The danger must be diffused. The ambivalence of our human hearts must, must be fixed. But if you're part of the problem, how can you solve it? It's like having someone standing over you with a big stick. And he says, if you move, I'll hit you. And if you don't move, I'll hit you. You need somebody from the outside to come take the stick away. You need an outside agency. Somebody has to come. Like the law of sin and death, we stand condemned to failure. Thank God we have an outside agency in Jesus Christ. Jesus took upon himself the ambivalence of humanness 
Jesus went to the cross. He took the stick away. Jesus Christ has diffused the failed operating system, the software of human love, and he's given us a new operating system. So we must add God's love through the cross before we can receive a crown. God's love is summed up in Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Philippians chapter 2 reads, Each of you should look not at your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Jesus is the king of kings. He wears an eternal crown of glory, but there was a crown, a cross, and a crown of thorns that he had to bear first. Let's look a little bit closer at this portion of Scripture in Philippians 2. In it, Paul shows the pattern of Christ's love, the system software, if you will, of God's kind of love. Those who know Jesus' saving power have already had the software installed. The question is, are you still trying to run on the old software? Jesus' model for us is God's love in action. His love is the antithesis of Adam. Adam found equality of God, with God something to be grasped and became disobedient unto death. This is the sin pattern of of our old software, self-exaltation. Jesus never stopped loving, and he never ceased to be God. He had the integrity of his God-likeness, but he emptied himself. How's that possible? It's right there in the text. The cross has a vertical beam and a horizontal beam. It says Jesus was in the very nature God or the, the form, form, the word form is morphe in the original Greek. He was in the form of God, and he never ceased to be God. He had integrity. The vertical points up, which is what godliness does. Godliness points up, representing our intim- intimate relationship with God. Though none go with me, still I'll follow. No turning back. I stand before the audience of one. I have integrity. I know who I am and whom I serve. I know who bought me with a price. But there's another step. Jesus put on the very nature or the form of a servant. He made himself nothing. He became a sacrifice. The horizontal beam extends out to the world, to our neighbors, It's brotherly kindness. Godliness is who we are in Christ. That's our integrity. Brotherly kindness is our sacrifice. Integrity without sacrifice is conceited. It's narcissistic. It's selfish. It's like someone who's stuck up or entitled, overachiever who would never sink to help somebody that's below their station in life. But sacrifice without integrity, without knowing who you are in Christ, is an invitation to oppression. Someone who is always the victim could never truly love someone else. We must have both godliness, integrity, and brotherly kindness, sacrifice, in order to add God's kind of love. Are you hearing me? Jesus said, go make disciples. Go spread everywhere the good news, this new software to bring restored relationships to the nations. 
First, those who hear will, re will receive a crown of beauty for ashes. That happens when people receive the good news of a Savior. But then the same gospel transforms lives so they can become rebuilders of dwellings and restorers of cities. For this to occur, people who know their calling are needed for every field of endeavor, every sphere of influence on every nation on earth. Just as a mustard seed begins with a small potential, we can look into the scriptures for special revelation of the call while looking at the needs of the world for general understanding of God's call. God's call for you may be to plant a church in an unreached people group. Or God's call for you may be to fulfill his mission as a gardener or a financier, a carpenter or an engineer, a journalist or an artist, an officer of the law or a politician. To do so, to know your calling and election, to, ma to make a difference, to be effective and productive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a witness to the world, you need to make every effort. You need to fight the good fight. You need to finish the race, which means you need to make every effort to add God's kind of love. And when you do, there's a crown waiting. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy when he knew that his life was just about finished. And he said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there's in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. The gifts we bring to heaven are the lives that, that we live here on earth. We'll be rewarded crowns for our life's work. It may be that you're called, as some of you have written to me, to be an intercessor, praying for nations and people. And maybe God's called you to be a prophetic minister or an apostolic ministry of pioneering new churches and movements for the glory of God. It may be that God called you for the work of an evangelist, sharing Christ on the streets or in homes, sitting at tables. Some others may have a call to the arts, portraying the beauty of the Lord through the dance and music and visual arts. Some sense God's call to sports, competing for the prize, for the greater glory of God. And others have already begun their work, teaching the next generation. And others are literally builders, repairing, restoring, rebuilding houses, buildings, and structures for kingdom purposes. Jesus was crowned with thorns before he was crowned with many crowns. John saw him and wrote that he saw in the he wrote what he saw in the book of Revelation. He writes, his eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. And there in heaven for all eternity, we will see the throne and the Lamb sitting on the throne. We'll see those scars on his hands and feet, and his back and his side. We will forever be reminded of the cost of sin. And we will always be reminded of the smallness of our shame that started this whole mess in the first place. When humanity failed to believe that God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. Do you love to worship? This is how John the Revelator describes what Jesus showed him of the worship that takes place in heaven. He writes, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. 
That's what the 24 elders do with their crowns. They lay them at Jesus' feet. Those crowns represent their life's work. Don't you think that we could follow their example? If we are given a crown, don't you think we'll take our crowns and worship him with them? I think that those examples will lead us to do the same thing. Our crowns are the rewards for all the words, all the acts, all the souls we bring with us to eternity. The fire will test the quality of each man's work, as it says. It will be shown for what it is. Some are building today with wood, hay, straw, but others are building with gold and silver and precious stones. What remains after the fire endures for eternity. These are the crowns that carry a lifetime, an eternity of meaning, of worship. God receives this worship in heaven because it has eternal value. And what we do now has eternal value. Do you want to be part of this worship? My prayer is that tonight we'll all see the heart of worship just a little bit clearer. I pray your longing for the appearing tonight. That your longing to participate in the beauty of the celebration at the wedding feast of the Lamb. To sit at table with the Son of God, the Lamb, on the throne. I pray you'll begin to see the reward God's preparing for you. And that with Peter, you'll know that on that day of his return, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor, as it says in 1 Peter 5.4. I want to close in prayer. I understand that there may be an announcement. Is that not true? Or is that already done? Okay. So let's pray. And I, and I want you to pray with me um, in your own in your own heart, I want you to pray about this worship time, about that crown, about that which God is preparing you to do and have been doing for his glory, that that's something that you can take. All of those memories of your acts of sacrifice where God has purged in you something, he's worked in you, he's led you to make effort, yes, as one who loves him and surrendered your life to him, there's something that you're offering more, more than a crown. You're offering your life. And that crown is a reward for your life. Let that be our worship tonight. Let's pray. God, you're worthy. God, you're worthy of our whole lives. God, we pray that you would receive the value of what we've done or are doing in our lives, that we would be able to present that before you at the throne and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Holy is the Lord, our God. You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We surrender that to you, God. All that we have and all that we are, all that we hope for, we say you are worthy, Jesus, tonight. And we're grateful, God, that you will finish what you began. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, visit our website at praisetabernacle.com where you can learn about the church leadership, find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. You can also like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube channel, and many other social media platforms. We hope to see you soon here at Praise Tabernacle. We are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.